Good day, Chris. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video recording interview over Skype. Um, for our audience, could you please introduce yourself and tell us where you live and where you work and what you do? Sure. My name is Chris Straley. I am one of the founders of Instructional Design Genius. I am out of Columbus, Ohio. And currently, we work mostly on measuring the impact of process changes that training enables. Thank you. Can you share with us a little bit about your background? Where did you grow up? Where did you go to school? What did you study? Sure, absolutely. So a little bit of a varied background. I grew up in New Jersey, so East Coast, moved to Illinois when I was a junior in high school. So I got to experience um, the lovely experience of going halfway across the country as a 17-year-old, which was interesting. Um, finished high school in the Chicagoland area and then went to the University of Illinois, where I majored in English. And at the time, I was already thinking about teaching, but wasn't certain if I was definitely going to go down that career path or if I was going to look at law school or graduate school. Um, and they had a really great honors program, which I was admitted to, went through that. And so I didn't go through their dual degree, which was education with English. Um, upon graduating, I took a year off, which actually was a really good decision in terms of just um, getting a little bit of work experience. That's when I did some of my first work as an instructional designer and um, just kind of taking a break from academia before I went back and got my teaching certificate and my MA in education from the University of Dayton. I then spent six years teaching high school language arts, so everything from English, uh, journalism, speech, creative writing, anything in that uh, space. Really liked um, the experience in terms of teaching the kids. Had um, some pretty, uh, here comes my daughter. <laughs> Hang on one second. So I really enjoyed teaching, enjoyed the kids, enjoyed the subject matter. Um, one of the things that you don't really think about when you're first going into education, people tell you about the poor pay and the hard work and everything like that, which is not a problem. But for me, I really like um, variation. And so one of the things that I actually found after six years of teaching a lot of the same stuff. So to give you an idea, if you draw five sections of freshman English one year, well, you're going to read Lord of the Flies five times a day. Right. And then you add that over multiple years. As much as I love that book and Catcher in the Rye in 1984, after a while, I just wanted some variation. And so I knew I wanted to stay in the field of education because um, I had some skill in it and I enjoyed it, but I wanted a little bit more variance than you'd get in a secondary education environment. And so I had already done a little bit of instructional design work for that year between undergrad and grad school. And I said, you know what, why don't I try to transition over to quote unquote adult learning, which is a, <laughs> a term that um, I find kind of funny. I can talk about that a little later, but moved into corporate education, really. And at that time, I spent four years working for Bath & Body Works and their store operations group. So they're part of Limited Brands, fairly large organization, did training all around workforce management, inventory management, um, risk mitigation, pretty much everything but the selling side because we had multiple training teams and the team that I was on handled a lot of the operational stuff. Um, as opposed to the sales skill, the selling skills that you'd see, <clears throat> excuse me, the associates use on the floor. After that, I had an opportunity to move over to another large organization, Cardinal Health, where I ran three different training teams that were dedicated to IT, data analytics, and soft skills, respectively. And that was a really interesting experience and how I first started learning a little bit about some of the options out there in terms of the evolving data analytics environment. And by building training for their internal team, I just became more and more intrigued in the opportunities that potentially lay there um, for our industry, which is one where measurement has long been a big challenge. And so I'm very fortunate in that my wife runs a successful company, and so I was able to really just leave the corporate world entirely and spend a solid year prototyping and working on building my own my own company 
and found some great folks along the way who believed in the vision and joined. And it's it's evolved over time from there. <laughs> Thank you. Can you tell us can you tell us a little bit more about what products and services your company uh, renders to the marketplace? Sure. So it originally started out as a focus on project management, um, specifically with some support around learning evaluation. And we got some decent traction. We went to ATD for the first time in 2017. It was Atlanta, I believe, that year. And it really used it as a giant focus group in terms of what what pieces of our toolkit around project management for learning initiatives are resonating with you? What pieces are still missing? How can we make this better? Because like I said, we were really early. And what better place to get feedback from just thousands of, of folks in the learning industry than a large conference like that? And the refrain we kept hearing over and over was, the portion, the tools you guys have around evaluation are really cool. Can you blow those up more? Can you expand on that? because it's such a, a area of need. And we kept hearing that refrain throughout the day. And one, I can't remember where she was from exactly, but a professor at one Midwestern university came over and said, you guys literally should just expand your tool set, make a giant sign that says, we measure ROI, here's how. And we really, we really internalized that and said, huh, well, we wanna do this right though. And so we went back and spent the next year plus from there figuring out a process to do real level four and ROI measurement without um, trying to pull the wool over the eye, should I say, that a lot of vendors, I feel, do in this space. And look at things like actual causation, which is difficult to do with training initiatives. And so we spent a lot of time figuring out how to augment our existing project management tools with processes and tools to support learning evaluation specifically. Very cool. Thank you so much. Sure thing. Um, let me switch here a little bit to, uh, can you talk to us a little bit about your first focus, your first exposure to HPT, human performance technology, or however you refer to that? Sure. What, what was always interesting too, coming from the regular, regular, coming from a traditional secondary education background and shifting over to adult learning, that's when I really started hearing a lot of performance-based. And it took a minute for me to really internalize that transition. And it, I've written about the whole idea of andragogy versus pedagogy, and is it really that different? But it, what was interesting to me and what I had to realize quickly was the difference between an exploratory situation like secondary school where the students are literally learning general skills, they're figuring out what they're interested in, and then hopefully going on from there and either following in a career or going to a university setting where they can explore it more. Whereas if you're in a corporate environment, really as much as it is fun to learn, and I love learning about literally every topic, in that environment, the training and the performance improvement should really be tied to whatever it is that organization is trying to accomplish. Because at that point, you're a steward for them, right? And so as much as I would love to go read history, that's not going to help Cardinal Health or Bath and Body Works. And so that transition, understanding that it's going to be a little bit more um, behavior-based, I guess, outcome-based, was um, my first real introduction. So who were your biggest uh, HPT, evidence-based, research-based, uh, performance-based uh, influences back then? Can you identify for us, especially for new people, to kind of point them to some resources, either people or articles or books that uh, you found uh, helpful? Sure. Um, in my background with education, of course, I had, we went through the traditional common model, so Bloom's taxonomy, and like I said, andragogy versus pedagogy, constructivism, behaviorism, a lot of these psychological models, which were kind of preempted by education and, and per repurposed um, for that particular application. So at the time, because when I transitioned in, this was, this was 2008, a lot of the, the uh, research-based IND was in its infancy. And so folks, I feel like Will, uh, Dr. Will Thalheimer, um, Donald Clark, some of these other evidence-based practitioners were just really starting to um, do their research and come out. And those are the folks that I've since really kind of attached to and started following and 
enjoying the way that they're trying to take education because we seem to have this this odd dynamic in our field where you have research folks on one side where evidence matters, right? We're going to treat education like any other science. We're going to set up experiments and we're going to have controls and pilots and make sure that there's you know, actual evidence. And then another group that almost takes exception to that, like, well, of, of course we're going to, we're going to do this. It's, it's just, it sounds good. Right. And so things like learning styles and all of that, um, which we found to be nonsense, learning to navigate that entire dynamic was part of my first, I'd say like four or five years of working in the industry and figuring out, um, which side, I guess, made more sense to come down on. I've since really gravitated towards the the research practitioner side, but also have looked to folks who haven't just done it in the lab setting, but how how have you applied it in the real world? Because I feel like that's one of the biggest gaps, is being able to replicate a given approach or given theory in the actual context of work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thanks. If you were to give us a 30-second elevator speech on what you currently do, what would that be? So like I was saying earlier, our, our toolkit enables um, measurement of learning initiatives. The project management tools, think of that as providing a structured, repeatable process to scope and design training in an effective way, whereas we also have consulting support to come in and help with the measurement. And one of the things that I figured out real fast if we wanted to do measurement correctly, we had to bring in partners who had skills that I did not and that my other current um, colleagues did not. And so we went and found an outstanding um, PhD in data analytics and statistics. And he really came in and helped shift our thinking around what was possible around learning measurement. And that's been a real key development. Ah, thank you. As a lifelong learner, where are you currently focused or what's your next focus for learning? And uh, are you working in, uh, on any writings about that right now? What can you share with us? Sure. I, I write articles for elearningindustry.com from time to time and have published a few others. Everything from um, andragogy versus pedagogy being a false dynamic to what actual learning measurement really looks like in practice. Um, one of my dreams really is to help shift the field in that space because I, I sense the frustration and you feel it when you talk to a lot of professionals and they'll say, I feel like an order taker or I feel like I'm not empowered. Training folks will always be crying their, their budgets, their limited budgets. And so I'm looking at that dynamic, but I'm also trying to stand in the executive shoes. And I think about it and I say, well, the sales teams, the marketing teams, the operations teams, these groups all come back with actual business performance metrics to not only justify their existence, but show how they're aiding in the, the mission of the business. And so my, my dream is to really bring some of that rigor and evidence to the learning industry so they can then go back to the C-suite and say, look, we do make a difference. We are influencing um, positive movement for the business. We're enabling cost savings. We're enabling compliance. Um, We're even potentially driving revenue. Here's how we know that. And so demonstrating that without over-claiming and over-speaking is... Mm -hmm. Thanks. Is there a favorite HPT or performance improvement term or phrase that you would like to define for us? Perhaps you feel that the current usage is problematic and you would like to put your spin on it or uh, uh, narrow its use. What I find funny is, and it's not even just this term, it's for whatever reason we tend to think in binaries. And I don't think that's just an educator's uh, challenge. I think that's human race, right? We're just trying to categorize things in our minds. And what I've seen a lot of, whether it be on educational sites or Twitter discussions or or discussions among local ATD groups, is everyone seems to think it's like an either or proposition in terms of we're going to do this or we're going to do this. Whereas if we really look at it, there are great pieces and practices we can pull from lots of different theories. And so instead of debating whether we should have user focus or um, learner focused 
um, training and development versus facilitator focused learning development. Well, let's think about the actual practical application. Well, what's the situation? What's the context? Because one might work in one situation and the other might work better in another. And so it doesn't have to be this false choice. And I'm seeing that really about every topic from neuroscience in education to adult versus child. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, as part of a wrap for this interview here, can you share with us any parting words of wisdom or guidance that you would give to the uh, our audience, especially the, the new people uh, entering the field? What, what would you suggest for them? Sure. One of the things that will become, I think, very apparent to you is few folks in the corporate or organizational training and development space started out there. We come from a lot of different backgrounds and fields. And so I think it's incumbent upon us to make sure we ourselves are constantly learning. See what's out there. Go on sites. We have a, such an active community of folks on, on Twitter and in organizations like um, the, the eLearning Guild and ATD. And people are willing to share for free what their experiences have been. So go out and read, go out and learn and don't feel like, just don't feel overwhelmed because education is such a big space, right? I mean, what a big charge. Figure out how to help all these individuals internalize and use new information. Such an easy job, right? Not at all. So take your time, learn, read, talk to other practitioners. There's some great resources out there that, um, I definitely think it's worth taking the time and looking into. Thank you so much. Chris, thanks for uh, engaging with me in this interview, and I hope you have a great day. Thanks so much, Guy. I appreciate this opportunity to speak with you and your audience. Thank you.